So the ancient manuscripts of Daniel that we have, the oldest come from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, there's a Dead Sea Scroll of Daniel that is dated to about 125 BC. So that is a, a copy of Daniel. It's the earliest copy that we've discovered so far. And that copy itself is from about 125 BC. So obviously we don't have the original writing of Daniel, just like we don't have the original of any of the, the biblical texts as far as we know. But it's still quite old. Before this, our earliest Hebrew text of Daniel was from about the 10th century AD. So that was very important. Now Daniel, like the other books of the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, those were translated from Hebrew into Greek very early. The Septuagint, uh, the books of Moses, that was done first. They didn't get to the book of Daniel probably until about 100 BC, but still this is, this is quite old. And normally, or for, for many books, this isn't so much of a problem. Uh, much of the content, most of the content, I would even say, in books like Second Kings is accepted as historical. But Daniel is one of those books that many critics really like to attack and say that it was written by not Daniel, much later than the time of Daniel, and that it contains all sorts of historical inaccuracies. So we have options A and B. We're going to look at this. When was Daniel written? That's one thing that's important that connects to the, the evidence from archaeology that we'll look at. And then is it historical? So option A, this is what you're going to find if you go take a course at a university, maybe even, even at many seminaries, uh, if you read an article in a newspaper, if you watch a popular documentary. This is kind of the mainstream view right now in, in scholarship or in kind of skeptical thinking of the Bible. And that's that the book of Daniel was written by an anonymous author in Judea around 165 BC. And this is the time of the Maccabees, the Maccabean Revolt against the Seleucids. So the Seleucids, you've been studying Daniel, you probably recall that that was one of the kingdoms that broke out of the empire of Alexander the Great. Okay, and the Seleucids were over the region which included Judea. And then they would class this book as historical fiction. Okay, uh, Esther is another book that, that often is put into this, this category in the Old Testament. Okay, so we see a lot of differences there. The author, they make a different author. Uh, they make a different location of writing, a different date of authorship, and then a very, very different uh, time period and cultural period. And, of course, this then uh, could have an impact on its historical reliability, right? Right? Someone, someone writing in the 2nd century B.C. still could write something that was correct about an earlier time period, but it's harder to do so. And it also contradicts what the book of Daniel says about itself. All right? So we really have five items in this, this kind of mainstream academic or skeptical view that is different than if we're just reading the book and accepting what it says. So the traditional view of the book of Daniel is that it was written by Daniel from Babylon in the 6th century BC during the, the exile and then the diaspora. So we could say that the exile ended during Daniel's life because the, the Jews in exile were allowed to go back eventually to the land. And of course that it's historically accurate. He presents many uh, historical narratives in there, some prophecy, some history. Uh, before we jump into the archaeology, there's a few things from the text itself, from the language, from how it's written, that suggest it was written earlier than the 2nd century BC. Uh, first of all, when scholars have analyzed the Hebrew and the Aramaic in there, it is earlier than a 2nd century BC date. So the language, like every language does, 
uh, changes over time. So a 400-year difference, you're, there are some noticeable differences in words and grammar. It looks like it's earlier than the second century BC. In the Septuagint translation, it also suggests it's earlier because the people translating it were unaware or didn't understand some of the words. So this, this would mean that uh, today you are translating something from contemporary Spanish into English. That's not going to be so hard, right? You can go to a dictionary, you can look up the correct word. If you're trying to translate something from the era of the conquistadors, which is about the same time difference here, that's going to be a little bit more difficult for you. There are going to be some words and grammar that have changed. So this kind of situation, they're translating into Greek. They don't know all the words that Daniel is using. They're unfamiliar with these. Again, it suggests a farther time back in the past. Uh, there's also the way in which Daniel writes his prophetic literature. This connects more closely to the area of ancient Mesopotamia than Judea during the Seleucid period. So it, it kind of situates him in a different time and place. Uh, the loan words for use for the musical instruments in Daniel chapter 3, these are really interesting. Uh, we look at these, and the, the Greek that's used, these are words that go all the way back to the 6th century BC. Now it's possible that they can be used later, and they were, but they do go all the way back uh, to the time of Daniel. You can look at some of those. Uh, we have you know, the words for flute and lyre and trigon and psaltery and so forth, all these, all these Greek words there. And then if you just read the story, it does not fit in the second century BC Maccabean revolt time. Okay, what was going on there? The people in Judea hated the, the Hellenistic Greek rulers and that culture. And they were, that's why they were rebelling against it, because they were forcing them or trying to force them uh, to adopt these pagan practices. And they were ruled by a pagan king. And yet, how does Daniel talk about Nebuchadnezzar? I mean, he's friends with him. He doesn't, he doesn't show this disdain for them. Of course, he doesn't agree with the polytheism, but it's a completely different attitude. If you read the book of Maccabees and you read Daniel, you'll see very very contrasting views of foreign kings there. All right, so those are just a few things uh, to think about in terms of the writing of Daniel itself, suggesting that it is earlier in time, that it is at the Babylonian period. So let's go into the Babylonian period itself. Let's launch back in time. And this Babylonian empire that Daniel is part of it started when he was either very young or, or actually probably even before he was born. So about uh, 626 B.C., it started with Nabopolassar, who had actually been part of the Assyrian Empire, and he revolted, and he established this new or renewed kingdom in Babylon in the south. And then it goes all the way forward to the last king is Nabonidus and his son Belshazzar, who... Daniel mentions, of course, and we'll get to him later. You can see the, the map of the Neo-Babylonian Empire here. So it covered a fairly expansive area, especially for the ancient world. It started to bleed into Persia. Uh, they took over Assyria, the area of Assyria, ancient Israel and Phoenicia, all the way up into uh, some of modern-day Turkey there. Nebuchadnezzar was a very successful general before he took the throne, Nebuchadnezzar II. And then, of course, it ends suddenly. The Persians come into Babylon and defeat them without a battle in 539 BC. And we'll look at some of the archaeology and history connected to that as well, because we have an account of that night in Daniel. Uh, the Battle of Carchemish is something that sets all of this up. And this battle is actually mentioned not only in Babylonian documents, the Babylonian Chronicle, but also in the book of Jeremiah and the book of Chronicles. And this sets the stage for Daniel. Here is the, the Babylonian 
account or a section of it. This is uh, about 605 BC, right before Daniel and his friends would have been taken captive to Babylon. It says that Nebuchadnezzar crossed the river to go against the Egyptian army, which lay in Carchemish. They fought with each other, and the Egyptian army withdrew before him. He accomplished their defeat and beat them to non-existence. So this is essentially where Babylon, they've already defeated Assyria. Now they defeat Egypt. Babylon is the world power. And they start controlling more and more of the nations, including Judea. And so what happens right after this? Uh, They go to Judea, they go up to Jerusalem, and Nebuchadnezzar besieges Jerusalem for the first time. Now, he doesn't destroy the city here. This is around, again, around 605 BC. Daniel 1.1 tells us that in the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. All right? So this is the first time that he goes up to Babylon. This is going to happen again and again. But this is when Daniel and others, not not the majority of the population, just a select few, are taken to Babylon into exile. If we fast forward a few years later, in 602 BC, Daniel's already in Babylon right now, and Judah, they revolt against Babylon here. They rebel. So they were... They were under the authority of Babylon in a way, forced, uh, but they still had their own king. So they decide they don't want to be ruled by Babylon, so they rebel. Uh, But then Babylon strikes back, and there's another taking of captives in 598 BC, including uh, we have some kings taken captive, if you recall. We'll look at some of those, those specific kings. There's some interesting material about them that was found in Babylon. And then you have the third wave, and that's the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in about 587 or 586 BC. Now, King Jehoiakim was the first one that's mentioned there. And some kings of Israel and Judah we have a lot of evidence about, others we don't have much at all. We have just a little bit about this king, but he is, of course, mentioned by name in the book of Daniel. He was the son of Josiah, who is a pretty famous king. Uh, his, his reign is from about 609 to 598. So he's there when Nebuchadnezzar first comes up to Jerusalem and takes away Daniel. He is also the one who rebels first, and that ends his reign. He is the, the grandfather of Padiah, and uh, we're going to look at, at that guy later. But we also have an inscription or a seal impression, really, of what's called a bula, that comes from an official who was under his reign, under his rule. And this is Gemariah, the son of Shaphan. He's mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 36. In fact, it's uh, from the fourth year of the the reign of King Jehoiakim. So just after this Daniel episode has happened, we have this passage in Jeremiah. There's this official who was under King Jehoiakim. All right, so right now we don't have any seal of this king specifically, but we do have some people who are connected to him. Babylon is the main location for the book of Daniel. Almost everything in the book, happens there. And this was probably the largest city in the world at the time. So if you see the map there, it was a very planned city. Uh, Originally built on one side of the Euphrates River, but they expanded it, and it had a wall all around it in this rectangle with the river running through it. Remember, Remember that the river goes right through the city because that is important for the invasion of Babylon later on, or, or possibly important. It's one of the explanations. The size of the city was estimated to about 900 hectares, which is about three and a half square miles. This is just the, the walled city of Babylon. People lived outside of the walls also. But still, this is a, a massive walled city for the ancient world. <clears throat> 
Again, about 200,000 people. That doesn't sound so big to us today anymore, but uh, if you said that 200 years ago, it would have sounded pretty big to people. Rome was the largest city in the world in the first century at a million people, but cities just weren't that big earlier on. And then actually, as far as we know, there was no larger city that eclipsed a million people until uh, London in the Industrial Revolution. So we've had a huge population growth recently. 200,000 people, you know, that's bigger than Jerusalem uh, ever was probably. It was quite a large city. Nebuchadnezzar is the king that gets the most playtime in Daniel, and technically he's Nebuchadnezzar II. This is a stele from uh, the Babylonian Empire, which actually shows an image of Nebuchadnezzar on the right there. It's, it's one of only a few images that has been preserved of Nebuchadnezzar himself. So he's got this special pointy hat, and he's got a scepter in his hand, and he's standing up. And this actually uh, shows a ziggurat, you can barely see on the left the, the step structure there. This was a, a temple, a Babylonian temple. Sometimes this is called the Tower of Babel, Steely, but it has nothing to do with the Tower of Babel. But it does show that kind of structure. Nebuchadnezzar had a very long reign, over 40 years. So 605 to 562 BC was his reign. He, he died and, and then his son took over. He was married to a princess of Media. It's pretty interesting when we consider that the Medes rose up and defeated the Babylons with the Persians. And she was a daughter of this king, Chiaxeres. We're going to talk about one of his descendants who might also be mentioned in the book of Daniel. He did have both sons and daughters. We know that from Babylonian sources. We don't know all their names. Uh, one of his sons, the most famous, was Amel Marduk, who is mentioned in the Bible. And then uh, Kashaya was one of his daughters, the one that we know the name of. And, of course, he was a very successful military leader and built all sorts of things in Babylon. Some, some of the things of which are mentioned in the book of Daniel, others are not, but which you've probably heard of, like the Ishtar Gate, the famous Ishtar Gate was built by Nebuchadnezzar. And this was there while Daniel was living in Babylon. On the left, you see a very old black and white photo of remains of the Ishtar Gate in Babylon. And then on the right, you have some reconstructions. So they actually moved sections of the walls of Babylon. Uh, this is in Berlin in the Pergamon Museum there. And then on the far right is an inscription that Nebuchadnezzar put at the Ishtar Gate. And part of it says, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the pious prince, appointed by the will of Marduk, the highest priestly prince, beloved of Nabu, of prudent deliberation, who has learnt to embrace wisdom, who fathom their godly being and pays reverence to their majesty. Uh, and then he goes on and on about how great he is and all these things. This is just a small snippet of it. It's a quite long. But this fits the profile of Nebuchadnezzar and many of the ancient kings. They're just talking about how awesome they are. And, of course, he cites two of the most famous Babylonian gods, Marduk, who was sort of the chief god of Babylon, and then Nabu, who Nebuchadnezzar is named after or has his name in his name. That was the god of wisdom, so very important one for Nebuchadnezzar. So Daniel saw that. Uh, that was the, the main gate of Babylon. The other thing that you've heard about, these are the hanging gardens, but these are actually not in Babylon. Somehow, these got moved to Babylon in the classical period by some authors who thought they were there. We, like we have 1st century B.C. and A.D. accounts like Diodorus and Josephus. They thought the hanging gardens were from Nebuchadnezzar. But if you, if you go back in time earlier, like Herodotus, if you've heard of him, Xenophon, okay, Herodotus uh, was actually writing just after the time of Daniel. These two guys, they were around Babylon in that era 
or at least knew people who had been there. And they make no mention of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. But we do have references from Assyria around this time or earlier that sound like the same type of hanging gardens that are described later on and attributed to Babylon. In fact, on the right there, this is an Assyrian stone relief of, of what we might call the hanging gardens of Assyria. If you can see, the king is there kind of on the top, and then you've got some irrigation uh, canals, small ones, and you've got all these different types of trees, and then you have part of his palace is shown up there. So it sounds pretty similar, and that's, that's kind of the, the current thinking in scholarship now is that the hanging gardens were actually in Assyria, and then somehow hundreds of years later they got attributed to Nebuchadnezzar. But why do I mention this? Not just because it's something interesting. I mention it because Daniel says nothing about these gardens. And all his quotations of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar never says anything about these gardens. If, if they were there, we would expect Nebuchadnezzar to brag about it. But he doesn't. And that's what we see from ancient historical sources. Is they, they weren't in Babylon at the time of Nebuchadnezzar. So we could say Daniel gets that right in not attributing them to Babylon. Now, think again about if he had written, if this book had been written in the second century BC, it's pretty likely that he would have said something about the hanging gardens of Babylon because he would have had this mistaken idea. You know, I just showed you those, those later authors around that era who thought they were in Babylon. This is another thing that puts Daniel in a different historical era. Now, the, the idea that there were Judeans in Babylon is not really criticized, but I, I do want to show you that we have some very interesting evidence that, that demonstrates the exile. So there is a collection of these clay tablets called the Al-Yahudu tablets uh, because of where they were found. They come from uh, ancient Babylon, not, not the city of Babylon, but the region, some of them go back as early as about 572 BC. So this is during the time of Nebuchadnezzar and during the time of Daniel. And they are tablets that describe a community of Judeans in exile in the Babylonian area uh, near the ancient city of Borsippa. Okay, but they had their own, they had their own village here. Uh, some very interesting things, though, that we see are that they're written mostly in the, the Akkadian script and language. There's some Aramaic, but we don't find all these Hebrew documents. What, what does that suggest to us? That these Judean exiles had been learning the language of the Babylonians and adopting that. You read in Daniel, that's exactly what the Babylonians force on them. They tell Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah that they're supposed to learn the language of the Babylonians, the traditions of the Babylonians. And it seems that the other people did that as well. Uh, also, we see the names too. Now, Daniel and his three friends, they all had their names changed or were given new Babylonian names. This is the exact same thing that we see in these tablets. Um, there are Hebrew names found in there, but uh, there are also many Babylonian names, and we can see that they adopted a lot of the Babylonian customs. We also see, unfortunately, uh, no mention of Israelite theology, if you will, or rituals. All right, so a lot of the people in exile seem to have just adopted Babylonian uh, culture and their belief system, or at least part of it. And, and we can see from the book of Daniel <clears throat> that that would be the easy way because they were commanded to do that. They were commanded to worship the image in that very famous passage before they get thrown into the, the kiln. And we'll, we'll look at that too. Right now, uh, not too long after Daniel had been taken to Babylon, I mentioned that, that first rebellion. And this is recorded in the book of Kings, 
So 2 Kings chapter 24 talks about uh, how Jehoiachin, this is son of Jehoiakim, uh, Jehoiakim, he uh, was led away into captivity. So the king was actually brought back into Babylon. And then it says that Nebuchadnezzar appointed a king of his choosing. Well, in, in the book of Kings, we get the specific names. It was the uncle, Mataniah, and then changed his name to Zedekiah. The Babylonian documents, the Babylonian records, talk about this same event. Uh, this is the Babylonian Chronicle, year seven of Nebuchadnezzar, and it says, the king of Babylonia called out his army and marched to Hatu. That's the name that they gave for the geographical region of Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, basically. Uh, he set his camp against the city of Judah, that's Jerusalem, and on the second of Adar, he took the city and captured the king, Jehoiachin. He appointed a king of his choosing, Zedekiah, there, and he took heavy tribute and returned to Babylon. So all the same stuff happens. Now, this isn't recorded in the book of Daniel because Daniel's concerned with what's going on in Babylon and, and the visions and prophecies he's getting. But this is something that's happening right at that time, and it's also just showing us that in terms of the Old Testament's records of this Babylonian period, we have a lot of evidence that is corroborating it from Babylonian sources and then uh, later from Persian sources also. Um, sorry about that. There you can see the tablet, and that's on display sometimes in the British Museum. Uh, but very, very important collection of documents there called the Babylonian Chronicle. Now back in Babylon and in the book of Daniel, we see the golden image. I had mentioned earlier that inscription on the Ishtar Gate and how Nebuchadnezzar's name was connected to Nabu, the god of wisdom. And then what happens in Daniel chapter 3? He has this massive golden image erected outside and he tells all the people they're supposed to worship it. Now Daniel doesn't tell us exactly who or what this image is. So we can only speculate on that. But I think, I think we're safe to say that it was either an image of Nebuchadnezzar himself or of the god Nabu, who was Nebuchadnezzar's preferred god and who he was associated with. Uh, it might seem strange, but we really have very few statues of gods from the ancient world, from ancient Babylon. Now this is usually because other gods later on were preferred by later kings and later empires and they would destroy those things. Uh, or they would melt them down or something. Other times they were just lost or if a temple got rebuilt, uh, they, would, they might get rid of the old materials. But we do have a couple of statues from just a little bit before the time of Nebuchadnezzar that that are probably representing the god Nabu. Uh, if they're not directly representing that god, they're representing some kind of uh, angelic creature, for lack of a better term, uh, that is in service to Nabu. So here's a photo of one of those images. Uh, this one's carved out of stone. It's not gold, but it'll give you an idea at least of what this image would have looked like. And then we have um, this, weird, this weird instance of him putting up this image, telling everybody to worship it, and then saying it's the death penalty and, and this very specific death penalty. But we have some very similar events that, that are documented by the Babylonians that connect to this. Uh, King Nabonidus, he was not not long after uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he changed his preference of God to the moon god, Sin. And he talks about this, and he talks about how he had a main, a main image, a new image of this preferred god made. So Marduk was the chief god of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar comes along, and he's associated with Nabu, and he probably 
This is why I think it's more likely this is the god Nabu, but he makes this image, this new one, and he wants everybody to be worshiping his god and the, the god he's associated with. And then Nabonidus later on basically does the same thing. So this is something we have uh, examples of in the Neo-Babylonian period. But what happens if they don't worship this image? Daniel, the book of Daniel tells us that they will be killed, and not just any type of death, but this very specific one. So Daniel chapter 3, verse 6, But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. That's, that sounds really extreme and purposeful, too. Uh, it's like they thought this thing through. And, of course, they, they don't do it. Uh, so what happens? They get thrown into the middle of this fiery furnace later on in the passage. Uh, the language that's used in Daniel, it sounds like it's a, a lime kiln. And here's a, an illustration of a more modern one, but it's built in the ancient way. So it has an opening at the top. And you can place material in there to, to melt that. All right. Now, the way, obviously, this was built differently, we can see that from the way that the story is told. It's not out in a field here like this. There's some kind of platform around it. It's probably in the palace complex. Uh, but the manner, the specific manner in which they are, when the, the execution is attempted, and the reason for it, the specific reason for it, is found in Babylonian writings, even of this same period. Now, what were they doing? They were, in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, they were committing blasphemy. It was a religious crime because they refused to worship this image. And that the penalty for that was complete annihilation by burning in, in a kiln. This is attested in the letter of Samsu Iluna from the 6th century B.C., same time as Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar. The basic summary of this is that it commands, those who have committed blasphemy against the gods will be thrown into the kiln to be burned and destroyed by intense flames. So this is a very specific practice. It's mentioned in Daniel, and it's also attested in Babylonian documents of the period. Same, same reason, same practice. All right, this is another thing that really not only shows the historical accuracy of Daniel, but it places it in Babylon in this, this specific context. Uh, another thing about Nebuchadnezzar. So he doesn't mention his, his hanging gardens, which don't seem to have existed in Babylon, but he does talk about his palace. If we look at Daniel 4, 28 through 30, for example, Nebuchadnezzar is walking on the roof of the royal palace in Babylon. The king reflected and said, Is this not Babylon the great, which I myself has built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? So he talks about his building projects there. He even talks about the royal palace and his residence specifically. So we knew that, we knew that he built the Ishtar Gate, right? Uh, we know from other sources like that stele I showed you actually that he built some temples. And then uh, he talks about his palace here in Daniel. Well, here are a couple of sources of Nebuchadnezzar himself that talk about his palace. So on the left there, uh, you can see the inscribed brick that talks about the building of a royal palace in Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. And on the right, here's a cylinder that describes repairs and the expansion of the palace in Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. And there are actually many, many cylinders like this, not as many bricks, but there's many cylinders of Nebuchadnezzar talking about him building things in Babylon. All right, he's, he's very well attested in the archaeological record. He wrote about himself or had other people write about him a lot. You, you weren't going to forget about Nebuchadnezzar easily. <laughs> But Daniel, Daniel gets that kind of uh, construction material right, and of course the, the profile of Nebuchadnezzar himself. 
Uh, one question that people often ask is, what about that weird time in Nebuchadnezzar's life when he was going through this madness or insanity and acting like a beast of the field? Is there anything like that in Babylonian documents? And this is one of those things where we might easily say we wouldn't expect that to be in, in Babylonian records because it's embarrassing that the king was out of his mind for a period of time. And yet there seem to be a couple of Babylonian sources that do mention this period and allude to Nebuchadnezzar being insane and having some kind of uh, serious mental issues for a period of his reign. So Daniel uh, chapter 4, verses 13 through 37, this is where we see the madness. We know that Nebuchadnezzar reigned about 43 years, so there's a lot of space in that time. And we don't have records from Babylon of things in every year of his reign. So it's not like we could go through and say, all right, well, it was in this year, this year, and this year. There's, there's big gaps. <clears throat> uh, but first, we go to a source from the 4th century B.C. Okay, this isn't contemporary, but it's at least quite old. It says something very interesting. It's related by the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, that as he went up into his palace, he was possessed by some god, and he cried out and said, O Babylonians, I, Nebuchadnezzar, foretell unto you a calamity which must shortly come to pass. So uh, this, this sometimes has been connected to the madness, but there's actually a contemporary document, a Babylonian one. It's a tablet of his son, Amil Marduk, and it's, it's fragmentary. You can see it on the right there, uh, but here's a translation of what we can get off of it. It says, Nebuchadnezzar considered something. His life appeared of no value to, to him. Uh, Babylonian speaks bad counsel to Amel Marduk, that's his son. Then he gave an entirely different order, but something happened. He does not heed the word from his lips, the palace courtiers, something about them being confused. He does not show love to son and daughter. Family and clan do not exist. His attention was not directed towards promoting the welfare of Esagil, that's a famous temple, and Babylon. He prays to the Lord of Lords. He raised his hands in supplication. He weeps bitterly to Marduk, the great God. His prayer go forth to. Uh, and then there's actually one other Babylonian record that says something like, For four years my kingdom in the city, uh, then there's a, a gap, gave me no joy. During this time not one building of any importance did I issue to be built the precious treasures of my kingdom I did not lay out. I did not sing praises to Marduk, my God, nor did I provide his sacrificial table with offerings, nor did I clean any of the waterways. So it seems that during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, there was this substantial period of time when he was basically out of his mind. People didn't know what he was talking about, what he was doing. He didn't do anything with the city. He didn't do anything with the temples. He didn't do anything with his family. They don't go into great detail about what, what he was saying or doing, but he just seems to be out of it. And our only other source for something like that in the reign of Nebuchadnezzar is the book of Daniel when he goes through this period of madness. So the Babylonian documents here might be talking about that, and maybe they don't want to go into great detail to make... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar seemed like he basically turned into an animal, but uh, they're definitely relating this time period when he was out of his mind and worthless. Now Nebuchadnezzar eventually dies, uh, but then his son, Amil Marduk, he, he becomes uh, the next king. Now Amil Marduk originally had a different name, Nabu Shuma Ukin. So again, connected to the god Nabu, like Nebuchadnezzar. But it seems he preferred Marduk, brought him back to the forefront. So he changed his name. You see Marduk on the, the end of that. This guy is very interesting uh, because of his connection to King Jehoiachin. And he is mentioned in 
uh, the book of 2 Kings, he releases Jehoiachin, who was in prison. Remember, he was taken from Jerusalem in that rebellion and taken and thrown in jail in Babylon as the king of Judah in prison. Apparently, these two met in prison because you see on the right, this is a tablet that Amil Marduk, uh, it records a prayer that he wrote while in prison. He was put in prison uh, during the reign of his father. We don't know exactly why that happened. There may have been uh, a rebellion or an accusation of a coup, something like that. Uh, but anyhow, he was in prison for a while, met Jehoiachin in prison there. He, he got out and he murdered, he, uh, excuse me, he got out and he released Jehoiachin. And it talks about how he actually gave Jehoiachin these rations for each day. And we're going to look at that tablet in a second. Uh, at the end of his reign, murdered by his brother-in-law, Nuruglisser, who usurped the throne. So after Nebuchadnezzar's time, there was a lot of turmoil. Now back to Jehoiachin. Here's what we see in the book of 2 Kings 25, 27 through 30. Uh, Amul Marduk, king of Babylon, in the year that he became king, released Jehoiachin, king of Judah, from prison, and he spoke kindly to him and set his throne above the throne of other kings who were with him in Babylon. He changed his prison clothes and ate bread in his presence regularly all the days of his life, and for his allowance, a regular allowance was given him by the king, a portion for each day. So uh, that's the, the biblical account. And one of these tablets here on the right, it says, 10 selah of oil to the king of Judah, Yaokin, two and a half selah of oil to the offspring of Judah's king. So there's, he's mentioned by name, his rations are mentioned, he's treated better by Amel Marduk. And then on the right, we have uh, Pedayah, son of the king, this is a seal, and again, this is uh, the king of, or excuse me, the son of King Jehoiachin. So one of the guys that's mentioned in that Babylonian uh, record, mentioned in First Chronicles, and we have actually recovered one of his seals. Now to the end of the Babylonian kingdom, we have Belshazzar. Belshazzar is the king of Babylon, according to Daniel in chapter 5. And this was, a, this was a huge problem or a supposed historical error for many years until some more discoveries were made because uh, critics of the book of Daniel said that Belshazzar didn't exist. He was no king of Babylon. They had no record of him that they knew about. And so Daniel then just made this guy up. And that was a major reason why they would say the book of Daniel was historical fiction. But then some more discoveries were made, and we read things like the cylinder of Nabonidus, King Nabonidus, which says, And for Belshazzar, my firstborn son, my own child, let the fear of your great divinity be in his heart, etc., etc. So he tells us Belshazzar is the first born son of, of Nabonidus, the king. And then, in another one of his documents, it's the Nabonidus uh, Chronicle, uh, excuse me, the verse account of Nabonidus first. It says that Nabonidus entrusted the army to his oldest son, his firstborn, the troops in his country he ordered under his command. Then he, Nabonidus, let everything go and trusted the kingship to him, Belshazzar, his oldest son, and he himself started out for a long journey. So when we combine the two, we see that Belshazzar is the firstborn son of Nabonidus and that Nabonidus left him in charge of the kingdom when he took off. And that's why Belshazzar is king of Babylon in Daniel chapter 5. That's also why Belshazzar offers Daniel third place in his kingdom because he couldn't give him second. He had second. Nabonidus was still the official king. Belshazzar was the co-regent. He was also king, but he was under his father. Daniel, the highest position Daniel could have been awarded was third place in the kingdom. So that was a very important discovery in terms of establishing the historical accuracy of Daniel after people were criticizing it for that chapter. And then it showed in these details that Daniel got all those things 
right, and it really suggests that he was there, that the author was there in Babylon to be able to know all of these things. Now, at that same time, this, this night, you have Babylon taken over. But it's very important, I think, that as you read Daniel 5, there's, there's no account of a battle. It's just the king Belshazzar is slain, it says. And if you read the, the Nabonidus Chronicle, the same thing. There's, there's no battle in Babylon. The city is taken without a battle. And Nabonidus is not there, just like in Daniel. Nabonidus comes back later and gets arrested. The Persians take the city without a battle. Uh, we don't know exactly from their account how they did it, but there are some other histor- ancient historical sources that talk about how they might have gotten in by using the river. Remember how the river went right through the middle of the city? Well, that's a good way to get under the walls. So Daniel gets that detail right, you know, no battle. He doesn't describe some epic battle. Just the king is slain. And uh, that's also something that we see related by Xenophon, that the, the son of a Babylonian king, also a king, he doesn't name him, but that would be Belshazzar, was killed when the Persians took the city. So... Daniel is, is confirmed by multiple ancient historical sources about this time period, about these events. Once the city is into Persian hands, we get uh, this Darius the Mede is mentioned. And there's been a lot of research done on exactly who this is. I couldn't tell you 100% who I think it is, but we have a couple of good options one, one that's been suggested is uh, a, a Median general named Ugbaru, or in Greek sources, Gobir, Gobiras. And he has a lot of things that seem to fit, but there's also another very interesting one. We don't have time to get into this, but it could be this other king called Kiaxaris II. Right? Remember I mentioned that um, the, the wife of Nebuchadnezzar was a Median princess, and she's actually connected to this family. So there's a lot of things that match up with this guy. Uh, we don't have time to get into that, but there, there are good explanations for this Darius the Mede in Daniel. Okay? I mention that because it's another supposedly historically inaccurate piece of the book of Daniel, but we have uh, two very strong candidates for the identity of this Darius the Mede. And then the Persians take over. We have the Cyrus Cylinder, which talks about the exiles being allowed to go back to their lands. Uh, Daniel, of course, talks about some of this restoration, um, and he references Jeremiah. We have names coming up, like Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. We have some documents that might mention him. Uh, They use the same name. They don't give us enough detail to confirm that. Uh, Also, possibly some of his friends. But just in summary, since we've got to end here, some some things that we see about the historical accuracy of Daniel. First of all, Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem, and he took captives back to Babylon. That's confirmed by Babylonian sources in the archaeology. There were Judeans living in exile in Babylon. We saw those Al-Yehudu tablets. We looked at the city of Babylon and the palace of Nebuchadnezzar and some of the other buildings that he did, the non-existence of the hanging gardens of Babylon, etc. Daniel's getting details like that. The fiery furnace for blasphemy and the Babylonian context of that. Uh, Belshazzar as the king in Babylon, but the second in the kingdom. Another very important historical detail, Daniel gets correct. The conquest of Babylon by the Persians without a battle. There's a feast going on at the time and the death of the king that's in Babylon. All that stuff confirmed by uh, Persian and Greek sources. Darius the Mede, we could identify him uh, either as Ugbaru the Mede or as uh, Kiaxares the second. I might prefer this option too uh, right now, but 
good, good possibilities there. And then Cyrus the Great rules over the empire. We have a lot of evidence of him. Daniel has interactions, uh, talks about him. And the possible attestation of Abednego and Daniel as Belteshazzar. So altogether we can give many, many reasons why the book of Daniel was written in Babylon in the 6th century BC and why it's historically accurate. And therefore we can take this book as truth, not as historical fiction. Uh, we didn't even get into talking about the fulfilled prophecies which demonstrate the accuracy of the book. But just archaeology and history alone demonstrates Daniel is a historically accurate book. It's not allegorical and it's not written in some uh, different time period much later on anonymous author, etc., as many of these skeptics claim. And so we have many reasons uh, to trust the book and, and reasons to give people when they might question the book of Daniel. Uh, Heavenly Father, I uh, just thank you for the book of Daniel and all of the helpful uh, theology, application, prophecy, and truth in this book. Uh, thank you that we have so much evidence that has been left behind and rediscovered to demonstrate the accuracy of the book of Daniel and its value. And I pray uh, as we go to break and then have uh, the worship service uh, that you will you'll guide those involved, uh, both music and teaching and everyone behind the scenes. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>